All right, hi everyone. Uh, it's Brian Babineau from Digital Influence Group, um, SVP and Media Director over here. Um, thanks for joining us. For those of you in the East Coast, thank you for joining us during your lunch hour. Um, we're going to get started here. Um, we've got uh, a group of great uh, panelists joining us. Um, we're going to be talking about um, branded content and using branded content to activate social um, and different ways of doing it, um, different ways to think about it. Um, we've got some um, great folks joining us here. Um, from um, Red Lever, um, from Juice, uh, the Video Distribution Network, and from h &R Block. Um, so we're excited to um, have this discussion. Um, so thanks again. Um, if you go to the next page, you'll see a picture of um, all of us um, smiling there from the PowerPoint. Um, one thing to note um, is that um, I've been in digital since I had a full head of hair. Um, so I had a lot more hair when I started back in 96. Um, and I've been able to work on branded content programs since 2003. Uh, most recently, um, I've done a lot of work with Lactate on uh, a program called Move Vision, uh, which is both about um, video branded content and about uh, publishing as content in social to activate our community. Um, and we've got folks um, here to talk about both ends of that spectrum. Um, and before we uh, have them talk about um, their areas of focus relative to branded content, I want to talk a little bit about why um, content is so important to activating social um, and why it plays an important role and why it's, it's really important to think carefully about how you use content and how you create content to activate your communities. Um, it's at the core of the new model. You know, you'll see here on slide four, oops, on slide four, uh, we're talking about the focus of social and that's the idea of unlocking the social potential of a brand and amplifying its impact and that greatest way to amplify the impact of a brand is through content. Um, content comes in lots of forms. It's video content. Um, it can be experts publishing. Um, it can be simply the presence of an expert providing answers to questions. Um, but those are the kinds of activities that really can bring to life the value that a brand is bringing to its customers and prospective customers. Um, here on page five, um, we're describing another reason why content is so important and why it's at the core of a social media model. Um, on the left, you'll see what is a, a traditional digital model. Um, if it was um, 10 years ago and you wanted to build some sort of experience in the online space to engage your customers and prospective customers, you would build a brand hub. And in that brand hub would live all of your content, all of your experts, um, anything that you wanted people to do, any value you were putting out in the space for, brand, for your customers to engage in, a brand would put in their brand hub. And then they would use traditional digital marketing to get people through to that hub. Um, they'd use online media, search, offline media, email, um, with lots of drive twos, lots of click here's. Um, in this new model here on the right, um, we're trying to reach people who are um, pre-programming their day. Um, individuals are um, making their own channels out of media. Um, they're using their iPods, their DVRs, um, they're on XM radio. So getting out in front of them means thinking beyond um, advertising and thinking about how you bring to life the content, people, and tool that used to live behind that wall on your site out into the marketplace. And not just out into the marketplace into media integration and partnerships, but into social hubs where people have a chance to actually interact with the content um, that may spur some discussion around it or interact with the experts or interact with the article. Um, that's our goal in this new model is to think creatively about how we take that content, people, and tools and bring it to life um, in the social space in a meaningful way. On slide six, um, you'll see uh, what we're calling our social experience activation framework, which is a, a, a funky um, series of words. Um, really, the idea is at the core of anything we're doing on behalf of a client and anything our clients are doing, um, it's about an experience and building some sort of experience that represents the brand. Um, and then as we talked about in the new and old model, distributing that experience out into key channels, both social platforms and partnerships. But what's important to note about these value-based experiences is that people find value in content, and that's why content is at the core of everything we're doing. Um, it can be custom content, um, branded content that's created um, from scratch to help bring to life um, a value proposition that a brand has, um, some uh, uh, angle on their product or program that is meaningful. Um, it can be third-party content. Um, we do a lot of work with um, some of our marketing partners to license exclusive content from third parties that help bring to life the value proposition of the community or experience we're building. Um, it can be user-generated content. 
Um, and obviously, this has been a buzzword for a while. But um, having user-generated content at the core not only gets um, brings to life the program value proposition through content, but gets people invested in not just creating it, but watching it and engaging with it. I mean, then brand assets. Um, we find that lots of our clients um, already have a great group of existing assets, existing assets that they're not taking uh, enough advantage of. So they're not packaging creatively in a way to really bring to life um, the kind of experience that they'd like to have um, with their customers and prospective customers online. Um, here on page seven, we've got some um, principles of creating value through content. This is going to be a theme throughout because um, you know the balance between making sure you've got the kind of content that feels authentic enough um, and engaging enough for um, a, a customer or prospective customer to actually spend time in engaging that experience um, is important, but also making sure that um, the key messages around the brand or product or the key value proposition is communicated clearly. Um, so that people don't just engage with the content and not know who's behind it, and not understand that it represents some sort of value of the brand that created it. Um, it's really important. It's a tricky balance to, to find. Um, so uh, I won't read through all of these, but some of the more important ones, um, planning strategically. Um, you know, building content um, does not uh, mean you're, you're treating it like an ad campaign where you create an ad and you send it out into the world, and then um, when it's done running, it's done running. Um, this is much more uh, of an editorial calendar focus on um, creating content, aggregating audience around the content, and then continuing to find ways to fuel new content, um, experts, um, new engagement um, on an ongoing basis. Once you've aggregated an audience, you want to continue to give them new things to react to. Um, we want to invite participation. Um, you know, advertising is about protecting the message. Well, um, creating content and using content at the core of your marketing is more about inviting participation. Um, get people to comment on it, engage with it, um, share it. Um, <clears throat> another key point, it's going to be created based on audience insight and fulfill the audience's unmet needs. Um, you know, it's, it, a, a lot of folks will um, think about content, or, well, what do we have to say? What is the message we want to talk about? What are the product that we consider an important focus? Um, without considering, um, is that something that the audience even wants to hear about? Um, if you start with the audience needs, start with insights about, the kinds of content the audience cares about, the kinds of needs that uh, brand or product can help fulfill on, um, that will lead you down the right path of thinking about the right kind of content. Uh, and then lastly here, I think um, um, staying fresh, um, being open. Um, you know, um, content has a very short shelf life. Um, the minute something interesting hits um, the digital space, um, it's passed around, and everybody who needs to see it has seen it by the time you know, 72 hours is up. Um, so continuing to refresh that content, being open to creating new content based on feedback, um, based on what people um, are saying about your content, what they're interacting with, what they like and don't like, um, those are important things. Um, and I guess I, I said one final thing. I meant now one final thing. Um, the relevance, the idea of being relevant, making sure your content lives in a place where it feels organic to its surroundings. Um, contextual relevance was a big watchword for digital media in the traditional space for a long time. But this is even more important with content, because with content, you're creating a different kind of value proposition. You're not talking to people. You're trying to draw people in. Um, and I think that means making sure that your content lives in a place where um, it fits in naturally, where it doesn't stand out. It doesn't feel like it's an interruption, uh, and people will start to welcome it into their um, daily channel programming. So with that, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk to uh, some of our folks um, from the video content space um, who are experts in um, both producing this content and uh, making sure they get it out in front of the right audiences. Um, first up, uh, Shane McGrath. He's the Vice President, Head of North American Sales for Red Lever. Um, they're a large global studio that is um, sort of at the cornerstone of advertising and entertainment. Um, Shane's got a long history in bringing content and producing um, big programs for McDonald's, Trace M.A., the U.S. Army, Paramount Studios, Grey Goose, um, and we have worked together on Lactate, and it's been great work. Um, so we want to let Shane talk a little bit about um, creating the content that is um, balanced appropriately between um, brand and um, entertainment. Uh, Shane? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so Red Lever, as Brian said, is a uh, global studio, um, offices in uh, London, UK, um, Los Angeles, and New York. And um, our core competency is the development, production, and distribution of original video content. 
um, in partnership with brands. Um, everything we do um, is designed to both entertain as well as deliver uh, a key brand um, message or messaging um, through the content or through the sponsorship of our series. So, you know, the first slide is really just a statement, you know, about the way we perceive it and really, you know, I think most people now understand that marketing now is, is not so much just um, a monologue where an advertiser delivers a message to its consumer, but really effective um, marketing is the creation of a dialogue, um, the creation of a community, um, and we, you know, believe that particularly in the digital space, original um, video content should um, not only be part of the media mix for an advertiser, but can really act as the centerpiece of uh, an advertiser's marketing campaigns or objectives. Um, you know, the digital space affords brands the opportunity to really become producers of their own um, messaging. So not just uh, traditional television where you're buying integrations, perhaps, or whatever. This uh, digital space allows for brands to really produce content that is all about them. Um, and then you know, the other benefit of digital content is obviously the targeting capabilities. Um, and at Red Lever, you know, we partnered with Juiced uh, to use a hyper syndication model as sort of the cornerstone of our distribution. And we target effectively um, to reach the brand's primary um, audience. So not only, as Brian alluded to, is the content in relative places, it's reaching relevant people at the relevant times when they're online. Um, and then, of course, you know, we still believe that there is uh, a need for additional online presence in the form of unique URLs, um, so custom-built websites where we can engage the audience deeper um, with the content. So while they've seen it in a syndication model, they're driven back to a site where they can engage deeper in the actual series. And then, you know, more to the point, engage deeper with the brands. Um, and then, of course, support it with media. And then, of course, most importantly, measure it um, against the brand's objectives and, uh, and their commerce goals. So I think I went ahead one. So how do we work with a brand? Very simply, it's, it's a collaborative process from the very beginning. Um, we share information, and we at Red Lever try to learn as much about um, the brand's strategy, its positioning in the marketplace, um, want to know as much as we can about your audience. Um, again, want to develop that content for them, um, not just put something out that we think is great. We need to know who you're trying to reach, what their sensibilities are, what, what the messages we're trying to get to them. Um, and then <clears throat> know from you uh, and the advertisers, we need to know what are your, your goals, what are your benchmarks, how are we going to be measured um, for success or failure in this, uh, in this collaboration. And then we do a full measurement, um, deliver analytics, metrics, et cetera, and most importantly, we deliver them in a timely fashion so that we can gain learnings as the um, series is, is live. Um, very quickly, for instance, we have had situations in the past where a particular episode, um, you know, in a 12-part series may not resonate as much as a few other episodes. In real time, we can switch out the rotation heavy up on the, on the content that people are enjoying more and sort of scale back on the episodes that maybe people aren't um, as engaged with. And it's important to be able to be nimble enough to do that in real time over the course of a, of a multi-week campaign. So as Brian alluded to, there is <clears throat> definitely a recipe here and a balance um, to engaging the audience with original content. Um, first and foremost, you know, at Red Lever, we believe it just it's entertainment first. Um, that is the only way you're going to really engage your audience, build the equity you need, um, and, and keep them engaged and watching multiple episodes. So whether it's an emotional series and a transformation of somebody's home or a fashion makeover or whether it's built to be comedic. We need to make sure that the comedy is on point and actually is funny and people are going to want to watch it. 
Um, in other instances, maybe we just want to be a delivery agent for information, but we need to make sure then that the series is in fact delivering information, whether it's a glamorous you know, look at different locations in a travel series or behind the scenes in the world of fashion, music, sports, art, we need to be delivering new and compelling information. The brand needs to be um, either entertaining or informing or even in some cases doing both. But when we develop, we have to make sure we're doing those things. Um, and then, you know, is the content delivered to be specifically about you and for you and about your brand's attributes? Um, you know, if it's very often in the automotive world, people approach autos and just say, we could put a car right in here. And that's just not, you know, any car then could, could take that role. We try to develop things that are specific to your brand. Um, and not just any brand can be swapped in or out. Um, and then, of course, integrations into the content. While entertainment should drive um, the, the development and, and drive what the series is about, it should be entertaining. We want to integrate where appropriate and organic your products into the series. Um, and we need to make sure that in the development process, those integrations are a natural fit to not only the storyline, but the locations we're using. Um, and obviously don't want to take them to a place where they diminish the entertainment value or irritate or turn off the audience. Um, and then, again, the, uh, the content is designed to engage, drive back to a site, drive back to a brand site, keep the audience engaged, and, and ultimately asking more questions, seeking out more content, and coming back for more. So at uh, Red Lever, we you know, operate in two different ways um, when, we're, when we're talking to brands. The first, um, the first uh, of our offerings is what we call slate shows. These are series that we are partnered uh, exclusively um, with producers, writers, directors, pieces of talent, um, creators who have visions for digital series. Um, and we try to find people with built-in audience, um, so a recognizable star, a recognizable or a popular blogger, somebody who's an expert in their space, an author, a designer, um, a, a musician. Um, and what we're trying to do in these series is align a brand with those pieces of talent, trying to get them as close together as possible um, so that they enjoy the rub um, off the talent and actually the talent can enjoy um, being associated with that brand because they're in, they're a perfect fit for each other. Um, these are series that have been conceptualized. Um, they have fully scripted in the cases where they're scripted, or fully detailed episodes in the cases where they're non-scripted, but they're not shot yet. So we have the opportunity to integrate a brand into the series um, where it is appropriate, um, and that is a wonderful opportunity, but really when we're looking at a slate show in its purest form, it's really establishing the, the brand as the delivery agent for this premium content. Um, these are series that are really designed to say, my brand knows my audience. We know that this piece of talent and the content they're producing will resonate with you, and we want to bring it to you exclusively. We want to be the people who bring you this content. Um, and in that way, it really is um, a sponsorship model more than anything, um, but with tremendous value because of the talent um, and what we have the talent doing in these series. Um, and again, you'll see this on the next slide as, as well because it's, it's always the most important. We want to make it so good that they will watch more and more episodes. And more and more episodes watched means we can engage them with the brand um, more and more times. So whether that's delivering pre-rolls in front of the episodes or just keeping them in an environment that's branded, if the longer they stay, the more they watch, the more we can um, deliver them the advertisement. Um, and then the second series is, uh, or the second opportunity is what we call a custom series. This really begins um, at the brand level with them sharing with us, their specific goals, needs, product launches, budget constraints, everything. They have, um, the brand in this case, knows they want to make an original content investment, knows this is an important play for them, they understand all the benefits of it, and they 
provide a framework and, and, and some guidelines for us to develop for them. Um, this series, unlike a, a, a slate show, is much more about specific, not only branding, but very often specific product um, and product functionality. Um, so it is char we're charged with creating that entertainment vehicle, again, always entertaining, but really with some key messaging to hit, some key product shots to hit. Um, so this is much more um, for, of a ground up experience with a lot of heavy collaboration um, on the script level, the location level, the product shot levels. Um, integration, unlike the Slate Show, integration in this is the core of the series. This is all about delivering on a product messaging and a benefit. Again, though, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we wrap that integration inside of something that is so compelling that people are going to want to watch all 12 episodes that we make so that they remain, again, in our branded environment. Um, so, you know, just down below is a quick example of, of a series we did last year with Gen Air. It was a cooking competition series set in the Gen Air kitchen. Um, obviously, at its core, all 11 contestants were using all of the products that Gen Air creates in this kitchen. Um, and every all of the marketing and so forth drove back to an opportunity to learn more about the product. The show itself, however, was about um, our contestants cooking a meal for a special, a special occasion. So at every episode, it was somebody who was cooking for their 15th wedding anniversary, cooking for an ailing you know, relative, cooking a, a traditional family meal for their family. Again, what the show was about at its core was that connection between the audience, the person, what the meal meant to them, and ultimately serving it to that person and that emotional um, journey that they went through doing this for somebody else. Um, you know, and hopefully people didn't lose sight that they were doing it all in the Gen Air kitchen, but really the real hope is they really loved what the people were doing for the other people and, uh, and, and then going on to the next one to see what that emotional story was. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Shane. Just to emphasize, uh, I think a key point Shane brought up, um, you know, in balancing out that, that, that value and the entertainment value and the, and the, and the production value of the content, um, sometimes it gets lost and de-emphasized some of the traditional marketing things that you need to think about um, around uh, customer insights, objectives, around measurement, um, and um, data that comes out of these kinds of programs. Um, and I think that, you know, people lose sight of that. It's really important, especially with content, when you're asking folks to do a lot more than just watch a 30-second ad. Um, you're asking them to engage with a whole show that you are laser focused to begin with on those objectives, um, on the target insights, um, what does the audience actually want, what will they care about. And if you focus on that and wrap your brand around that, um, that's where you'll find success. Um, so it's important not to lose that, um, that in, in fact, it's important to emphasize that as you begin to think about the kind of content you're going to produce. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, just making sure you find the right audience with the content. Um, you know, uh, Cliff Paulson is the Vice President of Sales for Juiced. Um, he's got over 15 years' experience in television and online video and, and a whole um, uh, bunch of history um, creating online video networks, programs, um, thinking innovatively about how to get branded content out in front of the right audiences. Um, so I just want to introduce Cliff um, and let him talk a little bit about um, making sure that your uh, uh, branded content, once you've built it, gets in front of the right people. Uh, hello, Cliff? everybody. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so, you know, once we have the content, it's very important for us to make sure that we get to the right audience. Um, we want the feel to be very organic for the people, so it's not content that's, that's put in a place where it doesn't belong. Um, and we believe that really the model is to push it out, uh, not pull it in. And what I mean by that is a lot of times uh, we have a saying that in the business that you would hate to throw a million-dollar party and have nobody show up. So what we specialize in is making sure that the content um, gets out to the people, the, the relevant people that they see it, but yet in an in a, um, environment that does feel very organic and relevant to where they should be. Um, so when we talk about whether it's push or pull, um, we're talking about do you want to pull them to your site, your microsite, or push the content out. 
you can do a mix of both, and we do do that. But again, I think the success is really making sure that we push it out to get the legs around it. Um, the other thing you have to uh, we take in mind when we're working with the clients is once we have the content, how are we targeting that content? And there's really two ways that we look at that, and that's one is it by the content itself, um, the content that's online, or is it by the audience? And the differences between that is if we're talking about aligning by the content, we're talking about um, once a brand entertainment concept is, is produced and, and out there, we want to align it to, the example here is all mom's content. Make sure that where this is, it's around mom's, mom's sites, mom's content, mom's videos. Um, so there, there, there's a different strategy on placing it out there and getting the legs around that as there is by audience. And by audience, um, the way we target that is, is obviously through behavioral, um, through categories. Um, what w behavior, what are they interested in, what sites are they going to, um, a lot of that can be through our technology of cookie base, but again, it, it's it's more about the audience himself, not so much about the content. So again, we break it into two different um, sectors there. Um, so an example of that is again, as I mentioned, that a lot of times people who do brand entertainment concept or brand entertainment programs will put it onto a portal. Um, that that is a great strategy. Unfortunately, a lot of times with the portal, it can get put on a page that's five or pa ten pages deep and doesn't get the legs that it really deserves. So what we do is, again, in targeting, if you look at this example here, here's a portal that you can take the same model and then push it out. Um, and whether we're doing it in-stream or in-band or the different ways that we're pushing that out, um, and sorry, the animation, is by aggravating the audiences um, in many different ways, and some of that by being um, by demographics. So again, if you're talking about you want to be uh, reaching women 25, 54, what we do is we we usually take the Comscore information there, and we'll target all of our partner publishers that are very strong and have the high SKUs of women 25, 54. Um, if there's other ways you want to do by channel, so you want to be in sports, or as I mentioned earlier, it's mom's content. Then what we do is not focus so much on the demographic information, but more about the content on the sites, and we can target is that by that um, option as well. Another way that I was talking about is by behavioral. So what are these people doing? Um, are they interacting? Are they going to your site um, to view the content and then going off? We can hit them by retargeting or um, by following them throughout online and hitting them in various different types of sites. Um, the, another thing that's very important is obviously one of the concerns when we're taking people's content and syndicating it out online is the fear of where is it going to land and is it going to be in some kind of content that the brand is nervous about or doesn't is not relevant to the brand and puts the brand in jeopardy um, w with their persona. So one thing that we take very seriously is making sure that we're protecting your brand. And this is just some examples of how we're doing that. We are, uh, Juice is a global company, so we actually have to abide by uh, global stand standards, which is IHASH, um, IHASH compliant. They're a little bit more stricter than the IAB compliancy, um, but again, that's, that's fine by us because, again, it's, if we put your brand in a, an environment that is um, uh, not the right environment for your brand, and we know that you know that's potentially harmful to the personality of the brand you guys are developing. Other things that we're doing is we do have um, we use third-party providers as Ad Expose and Double Verify, and then also by targeting, you can see up top I talk about uh, Blue Kai. So Blue Kai is, is segments that we know um, behavioral, what's going on out there, making sure again that if we are going by behavioral, um, we're really contacting the right people and putting that message in front of the. the uh, your audience at the right time and in the right place. Um, so different ways that we're, we're getting that out. This is just a couple of screenshots. Um, we have multiple functionalities in that online we can do in banner and I know Shane had talked about a couple of examples where we do syndicate it out in, in banner. Um, this is something that you know we actually love the most because it's, it's pretty much creating a microsite where you're not having the user drive away from it. They can engage and stay with the, the content engage with it, and they don't have to go anywhere else. Um, and then within this unit itself, we can report um, various different metrics of, of what are they engaging with, what are they spending the most time with. And again, the reason why this is usually the most successful is because you don't have to drive the user somewhere else. Um, a lot of times within the unit itself, there is a microsite that we can drive them to. Um, but a lot of the brands that we've worked with, wants to, they want to put the most information possible within the in-banner unit. So again, the user doesn't have to go anywhere else. Um, another, you know, another way of getting the, the message out there is we'll combine a high-impact uh, 
uh, sponsorship. And what that means is on some of the sites that we own, um, we do skins and, and site takeovers. So really getting that high impact sponsorship ability out there so people are aware that you guys have a brand that that is in, in a certain stage of promoting a certain product or a certain content, like Shane was saying, making sure it's entertaining, really driving the audience and making them aware of it. Um, the other is in-stream, so what we do uh, is also cut 15 and 30 second pre-roll commercials and, and roll that out also to, again, hit another another way of just driving, hitting the audience and driving them to, um, whether it be an in-band or to the site, to get them aware of what the campaign is about. And lastly, um, we do take it offline with our um, Juice application, iPad application. Um, we've had success with American Express, where again, this was just another way of hitting, uh, um, we like to say, the, the thought leaders and, and um, really the young audience. It's these type of people who are engaging with the apps on the iPad are very tech savvy. Um, they're the type of people that really are loyal to a brand, um, and, and it's, that's why it's important for a brand, if they can extend off online into another digital extension, um, the iPad is a great example of how to get to, how to build loyalty with this audience. Um, and also at the end, so Shane was talking about one of the key things is making sure what are the success measurements, what are we trying to accomplish. Um, with, with Shane and his group, it's who's the audience, where, they, where do you want to get to them, where do you want to reach them. For us, it's also coming back at the end of the campaign and showing you, okay, we wanted to reach 2554 and we wanted to reach them in this content. And so what we do is making sure that at the end of the campaign you see um, various different metrics on how you reach them. And, and that's how we judge success and making sure that we hit the right audience at the right time. Um, in this slide here, you'll see to the right, there's a bar chart. What that does is not only do we report on the audience and, and how we reach them and how they, um, and the, I should say the, the profile, the demographic profiles of how the audience broke apart, but also the engagement time. So how long did they spend with each video? Which videos um, appeal to which demos the best? A great example of that is we had a um, bank last year that we worked with that had two different videos, and um, they were asking us to target uh, the older demographic, older women demographic. Well, what we found was one of the videos that was much more digital savvy and wasn't repurposed television was much more engaging to the younger women demographic. And what they learned was they got insight on that, you know, going forward, if we want to appeal to the younger demographic online, we need to make sure that we're not just repurposing our television creative, that we're really repurposing something that really fits into the environment of the digital landscape. And again, that falls back into the whole overall theme of making sure that it's relevant and making sure that it feels organic so your user doesn't feel like this is intrusive and it's just an ad that's right in front of them. So it, it's an entertaining, it's relevant to where they are, and it's something that they want to engage in and really expand the experience. Um, some of our best practices and learnings is, is that quality of content is extremely important. Um, there's a lot of UGC content out there. And what we found is depending on the brand, some of it you can get away with, but it really the best engagement levels that we've had are the, the quality is very professionally produced. Um, Shane, again, I know those guys put out a, a very, very high quality content. And, and again, it just speaks to we see a, a huge amount of difference in engagement levels when it's professionally produced and looks professionally produced as opposed to just being either repurposed or UGC content. Um, make the content entertaining. That's really why people are online viewing videos. Um, there, there's really three categories we feel that people are online viewing videos. It's to be entertained, uh, to find out how to do something, or to get updated news, um, you know, for the most part when they're viewing videos. So again, the more entertaining it is, the more engagement levels you guys will have. Um, making sure that the content is served in relevant environments. Again, making it feel organic, not being intrusive. Um, and that way, it's, it's just a, a continued flow for the online users to really feel that this is something they want to watch and that it is something that was targeted towards their interest. And as I just mentioned, really defining the success measurements before the campaign is launched um, for optimization. And what I mean by this is we can really target many different ways and put the content out in many different ways. But what really makes it successful is knowing what you want to accomplish and in real time, us being able to optimize, making sure we are hitting that audience and, and are getting those engagement levels that we're looking for. Awesome. Thank you, Cliff. Sure. Um, a couple of interesting points to emphasize um, from what Cliff just talked about. Um, this idea of a distributed network, uh, aggregating an audience, um, it can mean in a single place, in a single hub, 
but it also means aggregating an audience in um, a distributed ecosystem. We talked earlier um, about the new and old model. In the new model, people are engaging with content where it is, and you'll notice in how Cliff talked about pushing out the video content to live in organic environments where people can engage with it there. You're still aggregating an audience of viewers, even if they're not in a single location. Um, and this principle doesn't just apply to video, it also applies to all um, kinds of content. And we're going to shift gears now to talk a little bit about um, different kinds of content. Before we do, let me remind you, um, if you have questions that you want us to discuss at the end of the webcast, um, feel free to type them in the little box um, down at the bottom of your uh, control panel there. Uh, we'll be happy to address them. Um, but now we're going to talk about the other end of the spectrum um, relative to content. Uh, video content is one way to engage, um, but obviously the written word itself, um, engaging in social, understanding that your presence, um, your publications, your voice in a social channel is essentially creating content. Um, we're going to have uh, Lee Muter from H&R uh, Block. Um, Lee has been at H&R Block for eight years. Um, she's a community manager. She's a manager of social media. Um, and she also runs their enterprise social media content strategy. Um, so she's done an amazing job over there um, wearing um, all of those hats, a uh, single focus on creating a really uh, great community experience for H&R Block on their Get It Right community. So I uh, welcome Lee to start uh, to discuss um, her work with H&R Block. Thanks so much, Brian. And it does feel as though we're stepping back in time here. I wish I'd been able to talk uh, about what Shane and Cliff talked about. And H&R Block, as a tax services company, really was out in social media and using it um, for several years with some great campaigns, some marketing push. We had Truman Green, which was a YouTube uh, promotion several years ago. And we were in Second Life the moment it opened, giving tax advice in the virtual world. And after several years of this, we actually took a step back and said, you know, what is it that our consumers want? And we evolved at that point in time. Just over a year ago, we realized that what our customers want is a one-to-one -one relationship and help with their taxes through social channels. We found them all over message boards, forums, um, looking for tax help. Just a second, please. Nope, I think we lost. Sorry. No, no, sorry. I did lose my connection, and I'm back. I apologize. Oh, no worries. Um, so anyway, we listened to our customers and realized they wanted help with their taxes. They wanted content, uh, the written word, and relief from stress. So we, we stepped away from the marketing push through social channels and went straight to pure content. We launched our own branded community on our site. And the, the reason for that is that um, we are a regulated industry. As a tax services provider, we have to have disclosures on any written information we give, any content we provide. So we did build our own and launched it, and we called it Get It Right. And I lined up 1,000 tax professionals from our network, some of our most qualified tax professionals, to actually be in the community and be the spokespeople for the brand and answer one-to-one -one tax questions. And we did not promote the initiative. We launched in January of 2010, and by April had over 154,000 registered members, which is amazing. Um, answered more than 120,000 questions. And the really interesting number to me was that we had more than 1 million people view more than 13 million pages in four months' time. And I thought, we've really, we've really uh, filled a need simply by putting that one-to-one -one content provision in front of our customers. We took all that then. The really interesting thing for our enterprise was to say, OK, we have built relationships in the social channels by providing content. And now how can we turn around and use content and distribute it? So this isn't video. This is the written word. How do we now go out and scale this? Obviously, we can't serve all more than 23 million of our clients over a three-month period of time every year by working one-to-one. -one. Well, we can listen to what they're asking now with our community. That can be the source of crafting content that answers you know, global needs for our customers. 
So we look at our community and our content strategy as engaging now one to many, being fed by our community. We can use that as the basis for um, a blogging strategy, pushing content out on our own site. It also then um, is what I use to craft the content strategy for our Facebook page where we give content out and um, grew our fan base for the first time ever. It, it, we're not like a consumer, you know, a sexy consumer brand. We are a tax company after all. But we actually grew our number of followers on Facebook during the summer this past summer when you would expect most people aren't thinking about taxes. And in Twitter, we've continued to expand our following there, and we give very specific tax content fed by questions that the community is asking. And this year, we launched um, a pitch engine site. So what we said to bloggers is, we know that you personal financial bloggers have your following. They want tax information. Here, here is our content that we know our customers are asking about. We started crafting documents for our pitch engine page and um, opened it up to bloggers and media people to use as they will with attribution. And we've actually enjoyed great success this year with our content and working with bloggers. This year then, I'm in the corporate communications group here at H&R Block, but we are part of the marketing organization. This fed our entire promotional uh, view this year. When we realized what people want from us is tax, we launched our campaign for this tax season, the Never Settle for Less campaign, that was very focused around you know, working with communities and reviewing their taxes and, and broadcasting then the results of you know, how we helped communities and, and collectives of people. So we feel as though by having a community, identifying the content that our consumers need, this can now blow out through the enterprise, regardless of the uh, channel or the type of broadcast, whether it now can go into our advertising campaigns. We were able to step back and listen and identify the content that people were thirsting for. And I think it's back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. I think um, uh, Lee's presentation brings up another important point. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about in the do's or don't section is this idea of authenticity um, and relevance to not just your audience, but to your own brand and your own brand value. And I think we've seen how um, that comes into play relative to choosing the format for your content. For a brand like KitchenAid, um, displaying um, how the products work and all the amazing things that you can make with their products through video um, and through um, cooking content, which both appeals to that audience, but also really brings to life that brand value in an in a interesting and, and engaging way. That's really important. But for a brand like H&R Block, whose value proposition is built around um, tax expertise um, and um, the financial know-how that they are able to give their clients one-to-one, -one, um, something that is focused on sharing that knowledge um, through um, actual the publication, the written word, as Lee says, um, is both um, a way to engage their audience and provide that value, but is, is authentic to who they are um, and the, the primary value proposition they put on the table. Um, so thank you, um, everyone. That, those are some uh, good case studies and really interesting to talk about the range of content, um, choosing formats, um, making some decisions about balancing brand um, and, and message um, and entertainment, and also getting it out in front of people in a distributed way. Um, so now we'll just take some questions, if uh, there are any. Um, and the first is, can you provide an example of a brand that has had a successful relationship with a blogger? Um, I, I can uh, start with that one. Um, you know, we uh, actually do a lot of work with IBM, um, and um, Paul Gillen is a um, very influential um, technology uh, guru, if you will, in the social media space. Um, and he does a lot of work um, publishing for um, IDG. Um, we were able to work with him to have him help um, curate content, um, create content, inspire discussion for our um, InfoBoom program. It's a community targeting mid-market IT professionals. Um, and um, it was a nice win-win where um, for him to be uh, working with IBM and to have another chance to share his expertise, um, engage with folks who are in the same space, um, he thought it was hugely valuable. And we obviously thought it was valuable to have um, someone with his um, um, smarts and expertise and notoriety involved in the program. Um, so that's one good example. I don't know um, if, uh, Lee, can you think of any others? 
Well, we've actually enjoyed some partnerships with influential bloggers here at Block. Specifically, last year I did some podcasting with uh, a blogger named Eva Rosenberg, who goes by Tax Mama on the blogosphere. She writes a uh, blog for Market Watch and Dow Jones, and we've developed quite a relationship where you know she has been willing to open up her followers and to work with us and and get us out in front of hers, and then uh, actually worked together. Or I reviewed her book that came out this year. So our company and and Tax Mama. While we slightly uh, competitive kind of tension, work together very successfully. Yeah, and that's another good example. You know, when you're working with a blogger relative to content production for a brand, you know, aligning as you did with her and as um, we did with Paul to ensure that not only are we um, driving value for our program and our brand, that we're finding a way to put value on the table for their audience. Um, the blogger has an audience; they have an existing value proposition. Um, that they put out there, and that's why they are, have already aggregated people around them who read what they publish. Um, and so it's, it's crucial to make sure you're thinking about how to align not just with the message or the product or the program that you're building, but also with what they're already doing. Um, because if you care to partner with them, that means they're doing it well. Correct. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate everyone who joined. Uh, thank you, Shane. and. Thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Lee. Um, really appreciate it. Um, if you want to uh, view or share a recording of the webinar, um, www.digitalinfluencegroup.com is where you can find that. Any other questions, um, further discussion, please feel free to email me um, at the email you see on the screen. Um, and thanks again for joining us at your lunch hour. Happy Friday. <laughs>